What's happening, hardscapers? This is the How to Hardscape podcast, where we talk to you about how you can start and grow your hardscaping business. And today we have our fifth I Am a Hardscaper roundtable with two returning guests. Today we've got Nick of Earthworks Landscaping. He is at Earthworks Landscaping RF on Instagram. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. This is awesome. This is going to be great. And we've got Danny of Niche Gardens. He is at Niche Gardens SC on Instagram. Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It means a lot. So let's get this started here. This roundtable started here by talking about the two of you and your businesses and the directions that you're going with your business in 2021, because 2020 was quite the year in terms of how the year started, the uncertainty of the year, and then how that year really panned out for us. So looking back at 2020 and how your business is situated in 2021, what are some goals that you have set for yourselves and in the direction that you're taking your business in terms of, uh, you know, looking forward into the year? And I'm going to just let, you, let the two of you, uh, whoever wants to start first with this one. You want me to go, Danny? Um, I think uh, my my goals always year to year are just to do as good or or better than than the, than the previous year. I think um, this last year at this time, if I look back, I still obviously didn't know COVID was going to happen and everything. So I had a I had a um, decent outlook um, on the season and had some some jobs kind of on the on the books for the springtime. Um, and, and then obviously March hit and we didn't know what to expect. And there was a lot of anxiety, um, surrounding, surrounding that and, you know, how the season was going to go and everything. Um, so this year I, I, I know kind of what to expect. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think, uh, I think we're going to have another good season. Last season was one of our best seasons ever, which is, I think, pretty consistent with the rest of the industry. Um, so it's going to be tough to, to outdo last year, but, um, I guess one of my, one of my goals is to do as good or better than last year. Um, and just operate, uh, a, a lean company that that's running as efficient as, as possible. So that's kind of where I'm at this year. Danny yourself. Uh, I think our biggest one, uh, is basically survive 2021, <laughs> Uh, with the way last year went, uh, kind of up and down, um, you know, uh, of course, just making it through this year will be, be kind of the main thing. Uh, we're on our fourth year right now, coming up towards our fifth. So we're kind of in that make or break, you know, we're a young company. Um, but our main thing, uh, last year, our push was, you know, we joined up with Teco or, pushing real hard in the hardscape industry down here, kind of showing everything that we can do. Uh, I, I think we hit that goal last year. There's a couple of goals we missed uh, and we may revisit them, but this year is so set and structured. Uh, my fourth year I've always planned uh, to completely kind of do business management, um, kind of tighten everything up, uh, hone in on all the numbers, kind of make sure if I'm losing something somewhere, I want to catch it now. Uh, you know, is there opportunity for other areas? So really the grand scheme is more of a business management and we're, you know, still going to be pushing through with new designs and things like that and, and using new products and stuff. But the mostly it is kind of tighten up the numbers and get ready for number five. Uh, that's our biggest thing this year. Gotcha. So the, the two of you, in preparation for this, I went back and listened to our, our interviews together and uh, really noticed some recurring themes between the two of you. And Nick, you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, operating a lean company and and uh, what does that mean to you with Earthworks Landscaping? What does that mean to uh, especially, you know, take a look at last year, reflect on last year and then you know, what are you going to change in your business this year moving into it to operate more lean or to be able to become more efficient? You know, how do you identify those changes in your business 
to operate that lean business or to operate that more efficient business to make use more of the resources that you already do have? Well, uh, that's a good question, Mike. Um, you know, growing up in the business, I, I saw maybe opportunities and, and places that, that we could, you know, um, potentially save money or do, make our, our process better. Um, so, you know, maybe just by buying material in bulk and saving, saving money that way or um, renting a piece of machinery or having things delivered, you know, just things, things that I can take off my plate and, um, you know, maybe, maybe I, maybe I pay a little bit more for it, but it frees me up to do other things where I can make more money, um, you know, in the, in the long term. Um, so, you know, just, just constantly thinking of things like that and, you know, using, using tools to my advantage and, you know, all, all the, all the tools out there for the hardscapers. I mean, there's, there's so many tools that, that make us more efficient and save um, time and save energy and things like that. So just always thinking about things like that. Um, I can't really think of anything specific right offhand, but uh, that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and Danny, say, similar question to yourself, because uh, when we spoke, you were discussing a similar topic in terms of really operating efficiently, really operating lean in terms of the crew that you have that you're establishing and, and making sure that that they're paying attention to quality. And that, that comes first before you kind of move to the next step. And, you know, whether that's adding another crew, whether that's expanding. So what does that, what does that look like in your business in terms of looking at last year and making decisions for this year and the year coming up to be able to operate more efficiently or to make better use of the resources that you do already have? <laughs> yeah, so, Mine's going to sound a little weird at first, but uh, really, you know, of course, we're trying to run lean and stuff like that and make sure numbers match. Um, I, I'm trying to be more business oriented versus the installer. Um, but what's kind of already happened in this year, and it's I'm already seeing the benefit from it, is I'm actually kind of trying to let go a little bit. Um, and let everything that I did last year in training kind of sit back and let them play with it and, and let them produce. Uh, and it's actually becoming really good. Um, and the reason is, is because it, it's kind of like Nick's situation. It frees me up. So now I get to move around a lot more and maybe I'm not just trapped on this job, but I can also bounce back and forth between jobs throughout the day. So, you know, there's, there's the, the monetary side of it, you know, what, what actually is my burden number? You know, am I getting a fair dollar amount on workers comp? Am I paying right on my insurance? Um, all of that stuff is, is one way, but mostly it's looking towards the guys and kind of trying to teach them efficiency. So are a few things getting messed up? You know, they are, um, but at the same time, they're always getting better. Like for instance, they'll learn something now and they'll go, wow, I'll never do that again. And that's like money in the bank right there. If they've learned this, this way not to do it and they learned it the hard way and it wasn't too terribly bad, then it's just this extra insurance for me. Um, so really kind of lightening up on the guys, but then at the same time, um, I'm, we're trying to produce total efficiency as far as like how we move through the job. Um, trying to learn stuff now, like, you know, yes, it's neater putting it in bags and, and I can put all the bags, but how quick is it, you know, versus, you know, should I run it with a ditch, witch and just scoop it up out of a pile and move it that way. So little things that we were doing last year, I'm kind of leaning away from them this year, just to try to improve the efficiency of, you know, how we're handling things. Uh, like Nick was saying with tools and stuff like that, that's really big. Um, you know, like, like we're doing ever right now and the pave tech tool, it, it, it works great for it, but putting it down, it's a lot more efficient uh, to where Dean was even like, Hey, I can put it down faster this way. These are really light. 
But when we take stuff up to do inlays and stuff like that, that tool comes out because it's easier to pull stuff back up. So, you know, lean in, in, in terms of efficiency and in, in the way we move through a job. Um, I, you know, I am dabbling with materials a little bit right now, like kind of Nick had touched out, you know, is, is getting 57, picking it up myself, totally efficient. Uh, like we've got a job right now, I've hired a hauler to come in and haul and, you know, and he's got the aggregates I need. I get, he brings me a little sample of rock and he's like, I'll bring you a hundred tons of this. And I'm like, okay, done. Um, and like Nick said, you know, I may pay for him to haul, but I'm not hauling personally a hundred tons of aggregate now. Um, so I, it, I guess that goes in the column of, uh, smart, I guess you'd say working smarter, not harder. Um, which working harder is about all I know. Um, oh, and, and, you know, another thing lean going back to the financial portion of it is, is dedicating ourselves this year to, uh, a software, uh, something to management, it, whether it's like your um, spreadsheet, is it LMN, is it LMN and your spreadsheet, is it, you know, it's all these other ones I'm trying to find out from people, you know, how are you managing your money? Um, just those little avenues. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think Danny brought up a, a really good point about um, letting go. And I mean, you guys had talked about this on the other uh, couple round tables, I'm sure. But as entrepreneurs, we want to ha- kind of have our th- hands in everything. And it's always kind of hard. Well, it is for me anyway, to, to oh, let yeah. go of, of the reins a little bit and, and let the guys um, uh, do their thing. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an important thing to think about um, and just give them, you know, give them all the tools that they, they can possibly use and give them the knowledge and then let go and just let them do your thing, do their thing. And uh, I think beautiful things can happen from that, but, but it's always kind of mm-hmm. getting over yourself and getting past the, the control part that you want to have. Um, Our ego. Point. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, Our yeah. Egos? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah. I mean, Cause I mean, this is, this is our business at the end of the day. And, you know, yeah. we have a certain vision um, and, and uh, you know, where we want to take, take the company and the, the way that we want to have others see the business. Um, and it, it's always something that's hard to, to let go of and ha- and let somebody else um, do for you. So mm-hmm. that's yeah. a good point. And the, you read my mind because that's exactly what I wrote down here and what I wanted to bring up next. So let, let's get heavy here. Let's get heavy right off the bat and, <laughs> and ask heavy. you guys, um, <laughs> how, how do you know when it's the right time to put your business in the hands of someone else in terms of, you know, just a certain aspect? Because that's, that's something that I struggle with and I think entrepreneurs struggle with. And then especially tradesmen and and people who, you know, have their name tied to this craft. Uh, I feel like it's this um, perfect storm of, you know, we're we're craftsmen. We it's our name on it. It's our business that it's so hard to let go of and allow somebody else to, you know, take that little bit of control, even if it's on a job site or even if it's something in the office, because we've got it in our, in our mind the way we want it. So how do you know when to allow someone in your business to take control of something, say, on a job site? And, uh, and how do you know they're ready for that? And how do you know that you're ready f- to allow them to take that? Um, I, I think it, it, it comes with time, obviously, and, and I think you need to lead by example. I, I think Danny and I are the same. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm out on the job most of the time. Danny's out there and leading by example. And the guys are learning from the way that we do things. Um, so if you, have, if you have the right guys um, and you, you have the right tools and things, um, I think it just comes to a certain point where you – kind of realize that they have the, the skills and the knowledge. And then, and then it's just something that, that you have to come to terms with and just, 
you know, let go and, and see what happens. You know, obviously things are going to probably go wrong and those are learning experiences. You know what I mean? Um, and everybody can learn from, from those, from those mistakes or things that happen on the job. Um, we, we did it and those guys need to, to do it too. So, you know, might be a bumpy road for a year or two, but I think in the long term, um, good things can come of it. And, and if you don't, I think you, you potentially could be holding yourself back and holding your company back. Um, you know, if, if you don't do that. So yeah, that's my two cents, I guess. <laughs> uh, for me, it's, uh, I, it's a, I guess it's a feeling. Um, I think it's in the moment that you look at something and it's not right and you share that with them. And it's at that moment, they either like, man, oh my God, you know, it's kind of one of those, it's like, well, okay. Or when that reaction is, yeah, I need to pull that back up. I got to fix this. I don't like that, you know, or when you point something out and they go, you know what, I've been staring at that for an hour now and it's been bothering me. So that really for me is it's that care um also like how they interact with the customer um is really huge uh the the guys are young so they're learning um you know my son's been doing this for a really long time so you know how do I trust him it's like well I trust him or I'll take his life later on or something like that (laughs) but but uh you know but, but even still then, you know, we've worked in a relationship where, you know, even my son has been up underneath me for so long and I've guided and done so much that for him to break away from me, it's, it's really hard because it's like, well, what if I let him down type thing? Um, but I think it's in the care, um, just knowing that they care about what they're doing. They're into it. Um, I love seeing that, like when the guys post stuff, it's like, here's my work. You know, I think that makes a, it, that means a lot to me actually when, when people post their stuff. Um, and I tell you the other part that when I think they're ready is when they actually start caring about what other people are doing on the job. Like for instance, this, we're going to make a name up like, well, Harry's not doing this, or I'm really frustrated because he's not doing this right, or he continues to do it this way, even though I'm telling this way. So again, if I had to come back to one simple word of like, okay, what's your basic for a while or how you start letting people go? It's like, Hey, when I see, and I feel that care, mm-hmm. um, because like Nick said, you know, we've built this thing, um, you know, and I can be a, a, well, no, I can't a little bit. I can be very obsessive about my company, uh, and how things are done. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's no secret that I'll, I'll definitely, I'll go backwards in order for it to look a certain way or be a certain way so that when I leave it, cause I may lose on this job a little bit, but I'll make it up by, you know, the relationship they have with other people when they say they want stuff. So again, just everything for me, and it has to be, is just, do you care uh, does it, does it bother you that something's not right? Is, is there pre thought like you're excited to come to work the next day and because you've, you've thought ahead, Hey, I need this, 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 and this. So that, that for me is, you know, it might change as we get bigger, who knows? Um, but for right now, just to keep it kind of simple, it's like uh, look into his eyes, you know, feel into the soul type thing for me. So when it comes to employees, do you guys have set goals for your employees uh, in terms of productivity on the job site, in terms of, uh, you know, understanding what they need from you and what you need from them, that mutual understanding to make sure that they're getting to where they want to go and they're also helping you get to where you want to go? Do you guys have set goals that you sit down with your employees, you, you ask them what they need, um, and, and you set these goals to make sure that they're, they're meeting them. And if so, how often do you, do you sit down and talk to them about this to readjust, to know what's valuable to them? Uh, because as you know, people get older, the things become 
different in terms of perspective and and what's what's important to them at their time changes. So in terms of employees, do you sit down with them? Do you set these goals? If so, how often? What does that look like in your business? Danny, do you want to start this one off? Uh, sure. So um, that's probably going to sound different from Nick's. Uh, we have so much activity with each other that like sitting down per se, like in an office or at a desk, it it doesn't really happen. Um, we're, I don't want to play on words, but we're so, you know, uh, such a tight niche, I guess you would say that, you know, we kind of, and I don't want to encourage people to be personal about business in any means, uh, because you should always keep emotion out of business. But um, it's so tightly woven, you know, we're so small that we, we literally know what each one wants. You know what I mean? Um, they're, my, you know, mine are also young, so they really, it's not they don't have goals. They just don't have a lot because they're just now starting to figure things out. Um, so in the end, it kind of ends up I have more goals for them than really they do. Um, Because they're young and just trying to start to figure things out. Um, So to keep them on a path, you know, lo and behold, let's play God here. To keep them on a path that I feel is forever righteous in this industry. um, You know, I've set things up like, you know, you you have to be ICPI. You have to be NCMEA. You know, you have to go to our our local best horticultural school is, is SCC. You know, you got to go there, take some night classes. So one thing that I do here is is I encourage like further advancement. As long as it's something that kind of relates to me. Now, if you want to go take uh, nursing or something like that, then, of course, it doesn't apply to me. But if the guys want to go take, uh, like Francis Dean said, uh, uh, would you pay for welding? I'm like, yeah, I'd be more than glad to pay to have a welder on staff. Yeah, no problem at all. You can go learn it. So they have their individual goals. Um, but like as a company whole, this is, I guess, either good or bad. Um, everything is just like, go and create this company. You know, it's like everything that we need to do at all costs. So individual goals, like a monthly or yearly type thing, aren't really what we're doing right now as much as like, what are, what is everybody's needs? You know, what does Dean need? What does Tristan need? And, by the way, we have a new dean, so now we got two deans. So I'm totally confused now. Um, but it's not like it should be. So I want to tell everybody that also. It's it's loose right now, but it doesn't mean it's it can't stay that way when you have eight, six, eight, ten, twelve, fifteen. You know, there has to be monthly sit downs and stuff like that. So mine will probably sound a lot different than everybody else because it's more personal based right now. Uh, than anything else. Mm-hmm. Nick, I yourself? think uh, I think I lean that way too. Um, just just based on the fact that I'm out with the guys most of the time, and you know, I kind of I kind of know what's going on in their lives and whatnot. Um, not to say we don't sit down um, once in a while, you know. Um, right now we're on our off season. So, so we've got time and we're not together and and things. So we'll do, we'll sit down in the springtime, you know, before we get going and kind of reset and, you know, talk about the season, talk about, you know, where are you guys at? How can I help you? Um, and, and, and things like that. But, um, as far as goal setting and having the guys have goals and meeting benchmarks and things like that, we're still, a pretty small company and um you know it, it's not a monthly meeting or anything like that um so so kind of in the same lines as, as where danny's at you know um doing things that way uh it makes me feel a lot better <laughs> <laughs> i thought nick was gonna be like everything's structured and here's no. the form i was like oh my god no Thank you, Nick. I feel better now. <laughs> well, I like that you guys kind of identify that, like with, with your crews and the way that you work and the way that you guys are in the field with them. It, it would be really weird, I guess, to pull them into an office and then have that conversation, right? 
as opposed to you you identify that you know this is where we work together this makes sense that this is our environment that we have those discussions as opposed yeah, and, to pulling them out of their comfort zone right right yeah and it'd be awkward to to do it in the office and pull them aside yeah. like that we're, <laughs> when when we're you know we're driving with them in a truck we can have those conversations and just make it you know part of the work day you know as opposed to a you know a sit down meeting like that so I don't know if there's a benefit to that or not, but it's more uh, natural. Yeah. And what, what benefit, I got a couple of questions in terms of bringing employees into your business. So if you're, if you're trying to hire somebody, uh, it doesn't matter who it is, think about any level in your business, but if you're trying to hire somebody, why go, what, what appeal does it, does your business have to somebody coming into it? If, if um, you know, it's a competitive labor market as it is, what appeal do you guys bring uh, to come to work for your business? Is it that education factor in, in terms of improving them? Is it goals that you set with them and make it clear that I, I, wanna, I wanna help you? Is it benefits that you offer in your businesses? Or are there things in the future that you're looking towards to implement in terms of you know being that work uh, experience that really is appealing to work for uh, whoever wants to start this one off, um, I I think one of the appealing things uh, working at Earthworks is is that we we have a camaraderie um, and that's built over time I think um, and you know doing things like shooting hoops after work and just sticking around for an extra half an hour playing horse off the clock, things like that, just having fun. Um, and I mean, this is a family business. So if you come to work here, essentially you're, you're coming and you're becoming part of the family. Um, so, you know, no employees knowing that, that I care about them on a personal level, they're, you know, I think there's something to be said for that. Um, and then the camaraderie that, that we all have and, um, you know, coming to work here, I'm going to do my best to show you what it means to work hard, um, and, and teach you a good work ethic. Um, because I think that's important in life. You're probably as an employee, not going to work here your whole life. Um, the longest uh, employee that we've had is 15 years, which is a long time in, in the industry. Um, but I want to, I want to set you up for success in life and teach you um, what it means to work hard. So you, so you have that work ethic um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Danny, you're yeah, I, I, you know, I have to agree with that 100%. Um, I, I, you know, I also do use, I, I don't know if you'd say cocky or moxie or whatever, but, you know, I use that we're different. Um, you know, if, if you're, I tell people all the time, if you're looking just to get a job, then this is probably not the spot for you. It's not going to work out. Um, you know, there's that sense of family, you know, just like Nick said, and, and, I, I do get, I'm, I'm learning to restrict it, but I do get over emotionally involved in my guys' lives because, you know, I want to see them succeed. I, I, I want them to have certain things, you know, it's, you know, it's constant conversation between, it's like, okay, so we're going to get a four bedroom house with a two bath and one acre, and you're going to end up doing this and this, and this, and this. So it's, it's, it's that family, I guess, like Nick would say. And, and I guess it's also, it's, it's, you know, I couldn't, like I said, I couldn't agree with him more. It's that I'm going to teach you how to work hard. I'm going to teach you ethics. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you how, you know, it's kind of like, and, and Mike told me this, you know, it's like, well, you're a ditch digger. It's like, yeah, but I'm the best damn ditch digger there is in Greenville County. Um, so it's, it's that. Um, also, the biggest thing for me, and I don't like to kind of really over promise it because I'm still trying to figure it out. But my goal is to be employee owned in some fashion. Um, 
we still have to figure it out. I thought it was something really simple you did at first uh, until like accountants and stuff look at you and they go, okay, pick which one you want. You know, there's all these different avenues that you can do. But the reason I want to do that uh, much in my situation, you know, I, I, I am kind of the nightmare that I try not to avoid. So, you know, we run around between landscape companies and it's because I make 50 cents more or a dollar more, or this one works a four day work week and this one gets this day off. And so you constantly move around because there's no sense of this. Um, you're going to be taken care of. Um, and people ask me all the time. They say, well, what was it that made you start your company? It's like, I couldn't find anybody to take care of me. It's that simple. So I started my own thing. Um, and, and that is kind of, again, I don't like to false sell it because it's not actually active right now. It does take time. Um, but that's, that's definitely a goal of mine. Um, you know, whether it's profit sharing or something like that, but I I don't care who you are. I don't care what your age is. I don't care where you come from. Everybody wants to feel like they have sense of ownership. I mean, we, we try to own all kinds of stuff as humans, you know, so for somebody to say, well, that doesn't interest me. It's like, yeah, it does. Everybody wants to be part of something that's permanent. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you give that to people, I think that's how you get devoted employees. Because for me, I would have stayed at a ton of places that I moved around from um, if I felt like, okay, I'm taken care of. I'm not just like a wheelbarrow or a shovel that one day it's going to break and then it ends up back behind the barn type thing. Um, So that's, that's kind of where we're going with things. Uh, You know, again, I don't actively promote it as much as, you know, people say, well, what's your company all about? Where are you headed? I go, well, it's a fourth year. Here's where I'm headed. Um, So most of our selling point is based off of futuristic, if you will. And then I also do little things, which, a lot of people are like, you're totally crazy about this, but like clothing allowance, um, you know, you you know, I I require you have still toe boots. Well, I don't have still toe boots. I needed a job because I don't have money. Okay. Well, I'll buy still toe boots. You, you stay here for six months and they're taken care of. They're paid for, um, like a tuition reimbursement again, for something that applies to me, you know, nothing too crazy. Um, and, you know, that, that whole future buy-in is, is, I guess that's our biggest sale, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's stuck with some. They believe in it. They see what we're doing. Uh, and then other ones, I don't know what to tell you. Other ones just didn't get it. And, you know, some people just aren't meant to be in this industry. I don't know what to tell you. They're just not meant to be. Um, but that's how... I bring in new employees. Now, I think the biggest thing is, is why do you decide to hire somebody to come in your company? And I'll ask both of y'all that one. (laughs) Now I'm doing the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I think, I think you brought up a really good point about, um, you know, I've had a couple guys that had probably better paying jobs, um, but working for a company that cared nothing about them, they were just, just another person on the payroll. You know what I mean? And that's it. Um, And they've told me these two guys, um, the reason that they're not working there anymore and working for me is because they know that I care about them and that I'm going to take care of them. Um, So, you know, that's, that's a, that's a great point that, that Danny brought up. Um, and I forgot the question you asked me already. <laughs> That's because I'm not running the podcast. No, <laughs> uh, going going off of Danny, kind of what you asked there, but also uh, spinning it into another direction to lead further back into it. What is the ROI of investing into your employees? Because they could just leave at the end of the season, leave in the middle of the season. Uh, they could leave you high and dry. So what's the ROI uh, on your end 
to invest in, you know, tuition payback or sending them or uh, to get their ICPI, whatever it may be, or even uh, those, those benefits that you want to implement in the future, or even the benefits that you have right now, where is the ROI in that? I think, um, you know, if you, if you put your guys through ICPI and CMA, um, they're, they're going to know that, that you care for them and that you care that they have knowledge and things like that. So I think obviously beyond, you know, them knowing how to do things right and not having to redo things and whatnot. I mean, that's an obvious return on investment, but, but just also, um, them having the peace of mind that you care enough to, to train them in these certain aspects of the industry, um, that are important. Um, I think that that goes a long way, uh, as an employee. So, um, I, I would have to say the way that I view that is the future of the company. You know, there's a lot of times I've said stuff and been like, you know, I'll, I'll probably never see the benefit of this. You know, I'll, I'll be long gone after it's done. So, I, I, you know, I don't even know I'll ever see the total return on it, but I think just knowing that things are continuing and we're, we're headed in this different direction. You know, somebody said the other day, she said, um, you know, what makes the difference with you? And I said, what's that? She said, y'all just care. That's, that's basically it. You just, y'all care. Um, so it, I don't, I don't know. I really see a return on it as far as a financial one, as much as it is like a legacy, I guess you would say. And I've been told a legacy is like, you shouldn't have a legacy. I don't understand that, but um, I, I see it more along that line. Uh, I would like to see myself like Nick, you know, it's all these years, you know, or there's something up on the board that says started in, you know, and 15, 20 years in business uh, built on quality, family oriented. Um, I, I think, I think that's total. I think maybe my, uh, hopefully my grandchildren will, will get the ROI. They'll get the return on the investment. Maybe I'll just die with a shovel in my hand, man. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so the reason why I ask like a lot of employee questions, because I really suck at hiring. I really suck at uh, employees. It's something that I want to get better in this year. And so why I also want to stick on this and ask you guys, uh, I, I know that I've heard this saying before. I think it was from Paver Pete who said, uh, you know, people ask him, well, what's the ROI in training my employees if they're just going to leave? And then he says, well, what happens if they stay, right? What if they're untrained in your business? And, and that's a major thing. So you, like Danny, you said, you may never see the ROI on it, but it's something that has to be done. With that said, is there a point in time that you start to offer them more benefits in your business, such as going off and getting education, or is it right off the bat, hey, you're hired. If you want, uh, we'll reimburse you if you're gonna go get your ICPI, whatever education, whatever benefits you offer them. Or is, that, is there a little grace period in terms of, we're gonna see how you do, how you uh, interact with everybody in the business, uh, how you work, what's your work ethic? And then we're going to step you up to that next level where you get these benefits and where we start to train you a bit more. How does that progression look like in your business? Whoever wants to take that. So, uh, and I'll jump on this one because we had to do it. I think my wife was probably going to kill me if I didn't. Um, at first it was just straight out of the gate, you know, whatever we need to do to make this thing work. Um, slowly but surely getting stung several times for some reason i'm a hard learner um you know eventually the wife's just like mm -mm, we're cutting this off we're structuring this thing and so you know out of the gate if they need things like for instance i do the clothing allowance thing um you know we've had a new guy that joined us and it's like wow this about to go shove him up on top of a mountain where it's 40 to 50 mile an hour winds it's 
you know, 26 degree wind chill factor and the wind mixed on top of it, you know, so we had to do certain things. Now there's a limit to that. So th that comes straight out of the gate. But then if you don't stay with me for six months, whereas I see a return on my investment, um, then you owe me that money back. You can keep everything and go about your way, but you know, you owe me for that. Um, then the other is with education, you know, it's, it's not going to be offered uh, straight out of the gate. Um, it's more or less, it's our guys that are here now, of course, this is completely active, but a year will kind of be just to have an understanding you know, is, is this going to work out? Are they going to stay here? You know, cause some people can come and stay with you and they're just content. Um, it just depends on, you know, how colorful the balloon is that goes in front of them type thing. So when it comes to that, uh, we're going to, you know, stick to basically a year on that. Now, when we get to employee ownership and stuff like that, we've already been discussing that's stuff that's probably going to come at like the five year mark. Definitely. Nick, what about you? What's your thought on this in terms of benefits, how you structure them in your business after they've been working for you for a bit? Um, yeah, I think, I think there's certainly a grace period involved. Um, most of the, most of the time, this would come into play with, with my full-time guys. I'm, I hire, we're blessed that because we have a college in town and, and I can hire part-time guys for the summer. Um, a couple, couple, two or three times, you know, I'll get them to come back, you know, as they're in school as juniors and, and seniors in college. Um, so, so there's a little bit of, of um, you know, return, that's happening there. But, but most of the time, this is going to come into play with my full-time guys. Um, but that grace period, there's certain things that, that we need to know how to do, you know, um, before you can even think about ICPI and things like that. Um, so yeah, certainly after, after a year, if they're showing, uh, showing me that, that they have the right work ethic, that they're picking up on things and, um, I don't have to tell them every time, you know, we're doing something, how to do it again. And when I think that they're starting to understand some of the basic principles, um, then, then we can, you know, start sending you to, to training and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as far as benefits go, um, monetary benefits, uh, it's, it's three years, um, before, before we start doing, you know, uh, um, I, uh, IRA, simple IRAs and things like that. Um, so that, that's how it works for us. And, uh, going off of Danny's previous question about who do you know when to, who do you know who to hire, when to hire, but also not just that equipment. How do you know which piece of equipment you need? How does that work in your business? Are you guys more so, um, you know, you have a job lined up that needs this piece of equipment or just this tool and you're, you're good to purchase that because you know that you'll line up future projects to uh, put that piece of equipment to use or put that tool to use? Or is this something that you line up a certain amount of projects, you know that equipment's gonna come in handy for those projects and you're going to go out and purchase that, that piece of equipment. Do you take a look at your numbers to make sure, or do you go out and rent that piece of equipment beforehand and then start to get a, a good uh, sense of, you know, whether or not you need this full time in your business? Nick, you just purchased a skid steer recently. Yep. But I know uh, from our conversation, you were in need of uh, replacing your skid steer. But uh, where, where does it, come into play in terms of knowing that you want to purchase that piece of equipment that you need that piece of equipment in your business well i mean just for instance on the new skid that we got um i the the skid that i traded in was in 06 um and had almost 3000 hours on it so i mean it, it was getting to the point where maintenance was probably going to start you know up, you know costing me more than than um maybe a you know, a payment or whatever on the, on the new machine. Um, so 
And, and the, the machine that I got was, was one size bigger. It's a 74 horsepower machine, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, the step down from that. So now I have the capability of, of unloading semis easily, um, you know, with, with that bigger machine, I can do more things with it. Um, so, so just, just knowing that, um, that it's going to be more productive for me uh, on some things um, is, is the reason I got that on, on other things. Um, you know, as far as, as tools go, yeah, I'll, I'll rent stuff to see if I like it, to see if it makes sense in my business and then make a decision from there, whether or not I think it it's, it's worth it. Um, I think a platform like this um with a, a bunch of other hardscapers talking about tools and, and things that, that they use in their business is very valuable um, because there's a, guy, a lot of guys that I look up to um, and, and trust their, you know, opinions on things. And sometimes I'll just go right off of that. Um, you, you know, so uh, there's a lot of weight there. Um, so and Danny, yourself, how do you know what's coming into your business in terms of equipment and, uh, and what's your thought process on that? So, uh, you know, to build off the company or, or, or build it up, um, I guess with experience and being on jobs for so long, I knew there were certain things that I needed, you know, that were going to make my life easier. Um, so some things are kind of basic, like, well, I mean, it may not be for other people, but like a mini skid and a skid were kind of basic for me. It was like, like I needed to also get a rake and a shovel. Um, so some of them are basic. Then there's events where um, they, they trigger a buy. Uh, like, for instance, a big rock job that we had last year, hundreds of thousands of pounds of boulders, you know, we moved around. And you balance out, well, how much is leasing, how much is renting versus how much of a payment did that just make? Um, so there's a lot of balance game, you know, in those situations. It's like, well, you know, it, it makes more sense for me just to go ahead and buy it now instead of renting it because uh, there's a year and a half worth of payments right there. Um, the next biggest thing for us is uh, it's like – how many times do we say we need it? You know, it's um, like, for instance, right now, uh, I, I know, you know, we've split up pretty hard into two crews and a mini skid is, I mean, I built this company off of a mini skid steer. Um, so now this mini skid's like, okay, well, I need it today. I need it today. Oh, I need it tomorrow. Well, make sure you bring it home. So when that equipment starts moving a lot, it's kind of like, well, wow, you know, I, I do need another one. Um, and then, you know, the next thing is really is watching other guys. Like I've known about concrete buggies for years. I mean, it's, it's, I, I can't tell you how many of them I've ran, but it wasn't until recently I started seeing, you know, it active in the hardscape world was, you know, moving aggregates and stuff like that. So now I'm starting to kind of think like, well, after watching everybody, do I need to go buy another $35,000 mini skid or go buy a $10,000 concrete track machine, you know, a, a, a buggy? Um, so kind of necessity is driving a lot of stuff now because we have our basic quiver in, I guess you would say. So now a lot of stuff's driven off of, man, I really need this next day. Man, it sure would be nice if we had this. Um, and you know, the little things are easy, um, you know, like the airlift tool and stuff like that. That's easy, you know, to figure out that you need that. Um, but the other stuff is driven off of a basic quiver that a decent contractor, I guess you could say, you know, you can rent or have access to. But either way, you should be showing up with this, these items. And then the other one is really the necessity of how many times are we saying you know, I need this. I don't personally like renting, which is, <laughs> so when I say this, this is really weird. So I don't like renting, but uh, if Sunbelt has a tool that they want to sell, that's at the right price, I'll buy it. So, um, 
there's even when I get into equipment, it's not necessarily uh, I'm going to uh, rent it. Uh, it's much as am, am I going to buy a used one or am I going to buy a new one type thing. Gotcha. So what is that next purchase in your guys' business? What's that next piece of equipment? What's that tool that you guys got your eyes set on? Or, or Nick, was that skid steer the purchase of the year? What, what's, what's it looking like in your business? Um, I, I guess I haven't really thought um, really a whole lot about the next piece of equipment that I'm going to buy. I got a fair amount of stuff last year, but uh, one thing that I think I might rent or try out is, is one of these mini skid steers. I hear all these guys talking about how awesome they are. I've used them. Um, but I, I don't know that it's going to, it, it's going to benefit me. I don't know if, um, I mean, I've got two skid steers, two track loaders already. Um, do I, do I need a mini? What can I do with it that I can't already do? So I'm, I'm going to probably rent them on some of these jobs that we have. One, one thing I can see that might be helpful is, um, using it to backfill walls and things and maybe getting into tighter spaces and stuff like that. So I'm going to play around with, with that and, and, and look at that. One of the things that's been on my dream wish list is, uh, is a rotator for, for my excavator. Um, I, I love my excavator. I, I wish I had uh, a six or seven ton machine um, instead of a three and a half ton machine. I could still put probably a rotator on my three and a half ton, but um, I think I could do a lot more with that six ton and a rotator. Um, I could get into a lot more um, jobs, the type of things that, that I would really like to do um, building, you know, large boulder retaining walls and things like that. Um, a tilt rotator would be amazing. Um, I've rented, I've rented rotators. I know the capabilities. I know the types of jobs that we can do. Uh, but if I have to rent these things for a month or two months at a time, does that make sense? And and then it's just a, a matter of, you know, you know, talking to the to my wife, the boss about, you know, um, you know, this is something that I think we need. And I've had that conversation, just hasn't gone anywhere yet. So <laughs> Those are the two oh things I'm gosh. looking at. Yeah. Danny, what about yourself? Uh, so I am definitely wanting a track mud buggy. Uh, 100%. Um, or I need to definitely get another mini skid. Um, Nick, I don't know what to tell you, man. <laughs> that mini skid... Let me ask you this. Do you need two employees right now? Two really good, dedicated, hardworking employees? Do I need to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you do. That's yeah. what a mini skid represents. Uh-huh. I'm telling you, it's two people. Um, but that's, I, I don't want to bite off another mini skid payment by any means. Um, but if, if I don't do something as far as like a mud buggy or something of that nature, um, it, it's, it gets to a point where you're wearing people out again, it, it comes back, you know, how, how efficient can I move around on the job? Um, it's like today to not even have the mini skid. I don't know how much we moved in gravel, but Dean and I moved with just uh, a wheelbarrow and you know, of course, every single time we're doing it, I'm sitting there going, wow, man, this is a lot of money moving a wheelbarrow right now. And, you know, wow, look how little we got back here in, in this amount of time. So you start looking at that gravel you brought back there and you're like, good Lord Almighty, it cost me this much to buy it, that much to move it. And, and then afterwards, we need 10 to 15 minutes of this much money to take a breath and get water and stuff after it. So... Plus the bags of ice that you got to ice your back with. Yeah, I was actually talking about that. I told her I got home. I was like, well, my back's killing me. <laughs> um, but that's, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sold on a buggy, man. I think a track buggy is, or at least everybody on Instagram is making it look like I need one. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, 
Nick, you, from what I've seen about your jobs, you really do have that access that, uh, you know, you can put your skidsters to work wherever on any job site. Um, Danny, do you have the same accessibility to your job sites or are you more so? Oh. Yeah, that's uh, so I, I'm in the same boat and that's where that mini skid steer, you know, is, is an absolute necessity. Right? That, that's yeah. a good point. That's a good point that I didn't really think of. And, and maybe um, maybe that's that's where a lot of these guys are making that decision is because they're in cities, you know, in residential um areas whereas i'm doing a lot of work in rural areas with a lot of access and things like that so you know that's something i'll have to evaluate too mm -hmm. um i want to change the subject and move towards uh social media and what what role that plays in your guys business uh first off what's i i know i, I bring this up a lot the return on an investment uh, of something like Instagram and you guys taking the time out of your day to document, to post, uh, there's already a lot of things that go into operating and working in the field in a business. I can't even myself personally, uh, take the time out of my day to, you know, do stories while, while I'm working. I can't, I can't get in that frame of mindset. This is the year that I'm going to make a very specific, uh, you know, try to do that in my business, but I haven't been able to do that because, uh, it's just too difficult for me. But what about for you guys? What's, what is your thought process on consistently posting to something like Instagram or Facebook, whatever it might be, and doing these stories and uh, and making sure that you're posting and keeping up to date on your Instagram. Have you seen any uh, business come your way? Is it more so for the community and building a community? What is that for you guys? Um, I think I think a big piece of it for me is is the networking um, that I've realized. Um, from using Instagram. I've met a lot of guys, um, and got really good ideas, um, and, you know, feedback and, and things like that. And then, then there's the creative side of it. Um, I mean, I, I, I love being creative. Uh, I love seeing things that are, that are creative. So, so, um, you know, just getting the ideas, and seeing the inspiration and things like that is big for me. As far as um, as as far as posting stories and things, um, I don't know if if it if it's just kind of uh, something that I don't know if it, it I don't know if it's ever gonna do anything for me or anything's gonna ever come of it, um, but you know, maybe just legitimizes me to somebody that could be watching um, and potentially could be a, a sale down the road. Um, and, you know, just just teaching people that are watching, not not so much other contractors, but but other people that are watching how, how we do things and, and, you know, what goes into it. So they realize when I come with them to with an estimate that blows their mind you know, they realize how, how hard most of this stuff is to do. So, um, but the, the creative side, the networking thing, um, that's the biggest part for me. Definitely. Um, I think for myself and what we do is, um, uh, transparency. Um, it's everybody knows all the time what they're getting from us, what they're getting into. Um, it's, it shows all our daily activity. So it's, it's proven that, you know, I'm not afraid to show you anything that we do throughout the day, um, how we do it, whether we mess up or whether we excel and, you know, hit it out of the park. Um, it's also a good avenue. Um, I like, um, especially when our customers are active in on Instagram and they're active on their project in Instagram. So it creates a lot of excitement for them also, which 
spills on over to their friends and stuff like that. So it becomes more of a, not just a job or a project, but more like an event, uh, if you will. Um, I definitely get a lot of ideas uh, from it. I do definitely enjoy the network. Um, and I was actually telling Dean about this the other day. I said, you know, uh, I finally realized why I like Instagram so much. And he said, why? I said, because I get to see sometimes or hear other people's mistakes that stop me from making them. So it's like I've made the mistake, but didn't have to make it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that networking portion of sharing it, um, you know, I have people ask me, uh, you know, well, what about this? I'm thinking about doing this. Should I do it? I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. You know, stop. Um, versus me calling people and saying, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Should I do it? And then go, no, 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 Danny, don't do that. Um, and then also, uh, it gets back to that selling point of niche gardens and stuff like that. It's, you know, I would try to create a little hype about it. You know, uh, uh, Todd down at campus, you know, excellent, excellent at this. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, he tells me all the time we talk and he's like branding, 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 you know. Um, so, you know, that's that's a definite thing for us. Uh, I, I think also I, I believe the guys enjoy it, believe it or not. I think they get a sense of pride off of what they post and then me posting stuff about them also. Um, I think it, it, I think that helps a lot too. I'll be honest with you. When I first started this, I told my son, you're crazy. I'm not getting on Instagram. I don't want anything to do with Instagram. Um, and you know, I guess it was a year or so into it. And I kind of looked at him and was like, man, I was, I was dead ass wrong about this, man. You were, you're 100 percent correct. Cause we have, I've noticed now over time, I pay attention to followers. Um, who are they? Where are they from? Why are they following me? Is it just cause it's somebody else in the landscape industry or is it somebody from my community that doesn't follow anybody else in the hardscape? Um, and, and I've had people watch us and even be active on jobs that we finished. And then a couple of months down the road, it's like, Hey, we've been watching you. We like what you're doing. We'd love for you to come out and look at our place and do something like that at our place. So, I mean, it, it honestly, for me, and, and I know I'll have to start a website. And I think I even told you this, this last time Mike was, um, you know, I got to do a website. I, I really do need to do one. But at the same time, I kind of look at social media and go, why would you want to go to my website page when everything is right here? And it's, it's real TV. You know what I mean? Um, and that's another thing, you know, somebody, they really commended me for showing our, our mess up on a patio uh, it was last week or something like that. And they were like, wow, that was really brave of you. And I'm, I said, I thought about that. I was like, I, it really didn't take anything brave for me to show that, hey, I'm fully capable of screwing something up, catching it, and then turn around and correcting it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, that was really brave of you. It's like, no, nah, man, it was really smart of me, honestly, to do that. Um, but it's, it's interesting, you know, outside of meeting y'all and stuff like that, I mean, which is really cool. Uh, it's crazy how it's crazy how social media is and how it affects our lives. And, and honestly, last year was probably a good demonstration of that. Um, so I think if you're not using this as a platform and you're not being active on it, I think you're kind of missing out to be honest with you. Um, unless you're putting up a live feed on your own website or something like that, because people love to really know what you're about because now more than ever, People are really skeptical about trusting people now. Um, we're all a bit standoffish. And so when you put forth that transparency and, and, and you're showing them everything that you're all about, I think that that just amps your business up. Definitely. Comes comes down to trust, right? They, they, yeah. they get to That's know it. you and they trust you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they've been part of your day-to-day -day activity before you even met them. Yeah. 
And uh, I, I like what you guys both said there, you know, the community aspect of it, as well as, you know, the more people are putting this content out there, and Nick, you touched on this, it really gets that education out there into not only the customer's hands, but also people that want to maybe get into this industry. So really, it helps to build this industry up. Uh, yeah, however small a story might be in that, but if, if everybody's doing that, it, everybody's kind of playing up their part in that. And uh, Danny, you said the experience, it, it kind of uh, builds the experience for the customer. They feel a part of that project. Their friends get brought into that. And uh, I saw that firsthand in my business this year, which is a super powerful thing that, like you said, a website just can't do, right? This is something that's, uh, that's definitely stands out beyond anything to be able to create that experience for that customer, which brings me to differentiating yourself. We talked about it, differentiating yourself for employees coming in to appeal to employees. What about differentiating yourself to your customers? Why should a customer go with Earthworks? Why should a go customer go with uh, Niche Gardens? What's that differentiating factor for the two of you uh, in your business when you first meet that customer uh, what what draws them to you in, in terms of uh, you as a business owner, in terms of the brand that you've created with your businesses? What is that about it? That's funny that you asked that. I, I just met with somebody last week on Friday and she asked me the exact same question. She goes, why should I hire Earthworks? And one of the things that I said is... Um, you know, I, I just gave her a little bit of background about us and where we came from and and whatnot. But but I also brought up the fact that being a design build company, having me design your project, and then the seamlessness of of me managing the project and and seeing everything that we talked about in that concept design meeting and and throughout the planning process come to life and just making sure everything is happening the way that we talked about it um, as opposed to, you know, maybe a, a bigger company where there's two or three different layers of people that you go through from, from point A to point B, not saying that that's bad. Um, that's just not what you get with us. It's, it's more of a, um, you know, uh, you're working with one guy that's, that's going to take you from, from concept to completion. Um, so, so that I think there, you know, maybe, the, maybe there's a benefit in that to, to some people. Definitely. So. Definitely. Mine's more, uh, I guess really an explanation of why I actually started this. Um, a lot of times now, I guess, cause of the age, like we're really old, but the, the aging of the company is now we have people, they say, um, I know you'll do a really good job. I know you guys care. And I think that's the, the biggest thing for us. Um, when, whenever, uh, you know, maybe there's no contact, there's just maybe a blind call or something like that. You know, it just goes back to the story of how I started this and where I come from you know, and it, hopefully from that conversation, they pick up on experience. And then the, the second part is, you know, why we started, how we started is again, comes back to the caring portion of it. So I really just kind of, if they're not on social media and they're not follow us, it's just an education on who I am. And I tell people all the time, um, and, and I guess maybe this helps build trust, but I'm definitely a firm believer in it. And I think actually we talked about this, Mike, was um, this consultation thing, you know, and I tell people all the time, I say, uh, you know, I've got a lot of experience of this. I'll be glad to help you out. I'll answer any questions you've got. I'll help steer you in the right direction, even if you don't want to use me. Um, and, you know, I've parted with people before and they go, well, you know, I'm going to call some more people and get some bids and stuff like that. And I go, hey. If, if you find somebody else and you want to find out about them, nine times out of 10, I probably know about them. You know, they may call me up. I go, Hey, that's a super nice guy. He does a great job. Yeah. He'd be a great fit for you. Or, you know, one of those that you might want to run for the hills type thing. Um, so the, the caring portion, I think is the biggest 
part for me. And it, I guess the quality, which I guess comes with caring, uh, you know, I think maybe there's a hyphen between those two, maybe. Mm-hmm. And then uh, when you're first meeting that customer and you're, they might ask in, in your case, Nick, what your differentiating factor is. What about on your end to them? What's that differentiating factor for a customer to be a good fit for your business or not to be a good fit for your business or uh, putting it another way? What are some red flags that you might see when meeting a customer that makes you think they're probably not a customer for me? What is that? Um, well, sometimes it's, it's just a feeling for me. And I think that comes with experience and meeting with people and talking with them. Um, sometimes you just get a feeling. Um, and this is something that my dad talked to me about and, and kind of explained to me. And then, you know, it, it just comes over time. You're going to screw up and probably take on a job that you maybe shouldn't have because the customer wasn't the right customer for you. But, but those are things you're going to learn over time. Um, but, you know, you know, as far as finding the right customers, um, it, it all just comes down to, you know, the type of work that, that you want you, your company to be doing and, and can they afford it a, and, and is it the type of work that, that you want to do? I mean, it's, it's more of a mutual relationship type of thing where, where I get to decide kind of luckily in, in times like this um, you know, I, I don't have to be quite so picky. Um, but you know, you're going to, you're definitely going to screw up probably um, and, and pick the wrong, the wrong one. Um, but, you know, I, I think for me, it's just a feeling that, that I get, and I, I come away from a, from a, you know, initial consultation and, you know, maybe leave it somewhat open-ended if I do get that feeling during, during that conversation and then think about it and get back to them and say, you know what, this, this isn't the right fit for us. Maybe I can offer you, um, you, you know, a couple phone numbers or people that, that we've, you know, that we could recommend to you. I've got, I've got enough guys that have gone off on their own and started their own landscaping businesses, you know, that, that would probably be happy to do some of those type of jobs, or at least, at least I could give them a couple of phone numbers or names that, that they could contact somebody that might, that might help them out. But I don't know. It's just one of those things that I don't know if I can explain. It's just something that I, I can feel. <laughs> once in a while. Gut feeling. That's funny. So my wife refers to it. Uh, you all know, the movie over the hedge, uh, the cartoon, yeah. uh, my tail is tingling. Um, so that's, that's the biggest thing for me. You know, we, we actually, it's a joke. I'll come home and she'll go, well, how did it go? And I'm like, yeah, okay. And she's like, was well, your tail tingling? So, uh, it's, it's the feeling, um, it's, it's also, again, I don't want it to sound cross or cocky or anything like that, but I don't like for somebody it's the conversation is probably instantly over. If you call up and you say, Hey, I'm getting a bunch of quotes. It's kind of like, done. We're, done. <laughs> we're done. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you want to call it and say, you know, come and look at this and stuff like that. Uh, it's a good start for me. Um, it's, it's also, you know, that feeling coming away from it is with all my experience, you know, I don't walk into a doctor's office and tell the doctor how he's going to treat me. Um, I don't walk in and tell a mechanic how he's going to fix my truck. Um, so when I come to a job and somebody's like, well, I'm going to need this to fix this and do that and that. And it's like, all you need is labor. You don't need me. So that's, a, that's another kind of a walk avenue for me. Um, but really, uh, it's kind of a funny joke. My, my old boss a long time ago, who I, I think the world of, he's, he's a mentor to me. Um, and we were standing on a job and I, I don't know. It's a couple hundred thousand dollar job or something like that. And uh, the lady sitting there talking and she's like, well, we'll see how things are going to go. And she looks at him and he goes, oh, hold on a second. I haven't figured out if I'm letting you 
you know, work for me. I'm, I'm not sure if you understand this. I'm, 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 you know, kind of judging you right now. And it's kind of like, wow, man, did this guy just really say this to this person? But it's the truth. The reality is that, you know, he told me, he's like, man, if you're not going to mesh with them in the beginning, it is not going to go good to the end, especially when you go to collect. Um, so I, I know it might seem crazy. You know, Nick says it's all a feeling, but it is, it's 100% a feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And hopefully, um, hopefully you can kind of qualify them before you even show up on the job to even know if that's the right fit. You know, so, so you've taken the steps to qualify them ahead of time and they've, they've met those qualifications and you get there and then you get that feeling, you know, at least you've taken the steps to qualify them. So, you know, you have a, a decent shot of, of uh, having the right customer. So, so that's big, you know, just yeah. making sure that you're, you're qualifying them as much as you possibly can, you know, whatever process that, that is for you. What does that look like for you guys in your business? Is it, do you guys um, do that over the phone? Do you do it through email? What does that pre-qualification look like? Like what kind of questions are you trying to ask to get out of them? I know uh, both of you guys work pretty big on referrals. So that, that uh, in and of itself, I feel is some sort of pre-qualification because at least, you know, there's some familiarity with at least the projects you do uh, the if they're close enough, the people that uh, the money that they're looking at spending. Uh, but what are those pre-qualification questions, steps, whatever process that might look like in your business? Um, so a lot of our leads come through our website and to submit a, submit a form on the website, you just go through a, f- a few questions and, you know, um, what's your address you know, uh, what type of work are you looking for? You know, checklist of of different types of things and then budget. And, you know, um, I think our, our lowest budget starts at around $5,000 or something like that. So maybe that weeds out some, some of the tire kickers or some of the smaller jobs that, that I can't even mobilize for, um, and make enough money to do. So, so that right off the bat, you know, pre-qualifies some people, I would say, and then also get some thinking about budget, um, which is, is always the, the toughest thing to ask somebody or to, to have a conversation about. Um, and then, and then from there, uh, you know, calling them and, and just feeling them out and, and asking questions like, um, open-ended questions, like, tell me about, your project. Tell me, you know, maybe they left something like we want to do a backyard patio with a, you know, an outdoor kitchen or something like that. I understand you want to do a patio and an outdoor kitchen. Can you tell me a little bit more about the project? You know, and just open it, get them talking. And, and from there, sometimes it, it leaks out. Well, I, I, you're the third person I called, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, stuff like that, just comes out in conversation. Um, and, uh, you, you, over time, I think you, you, you get to really kind of weed, you you can see, you know, those people that are asking four or five different guys and they're just going to hire based on price. Definitely. Definitely. Um, I guess mine is kind of similar to that, uh, outside of the fact that, I, I kind of initially, if they're not just asking me straight out what they're looking for, or, you know, I say, well, how can I, you know, how can I help you out? Um, if there's not any real direction head with the conversation, I just start out basically, are, are you looking for some type of landscape maintenance or are you looking for a landscape contractor? And that kind of starts out a lot of questions and they say, well, Oh, well, you don't do maintenance. I'm like, no, I'm just an installation contractor. Oh, well, what's the stuff you do? So I end up blurting off the things that we do. Um, but, uh, I, I, I guess Mike, we kind of talked about this and I felt like we kind of hit the same on this earlier. I, I do, I do want the website. I, I love the idea of having, the website and fill out a, you know, the form and kind of get things going. I, I, 
I do want that. That's actually might be the only reason why I want a website page. Um, but if, if it's not something like I pick up on the phone and they say, well, I need my yard mulch. It's kind of like, no, 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 I'm not that. Um, I go and act on just about everything because if there's one thing I've learned is, you know, they say, well, I've got this washout area on the side of my driveway and I just need something to cover it up and, you know, to where it's not eroding. And so, you know, I may think, oh, it's just uh, some fabric, some felt fabric and some river gravel and a couple of plants. That's it. Versus showing up and going, oh, wow, you know, we kind of need to do this, this and this to take care of this issue back here that's coming from this neighbor. And so it, it kind of develops itself while I'm there. So they have this idea of a situation or problem they're in. But once I'm there, I can kind of say, well, here's all the facets of it. And nine times out of 10, you know, if, if I can manage to sound educated enough or experienced enough on whatever the subject matter is, you know, by the end, it's, it's, you know, they could feel overwhelmed and, and say, well, that, wow, this is a lot. And so my sell at that point is, hey, let's draw everything up. Let's look at the whole project and in, in, in everything and let's break it into gardens, which was what I was taught by Mike. He's like, you know, you you don't have to do the whole job in the beginning because you need residual money. So give them a whole scheme, a whole plan and then turn around, get a buy into it and start to initiate it to where this won't necessarily make sense by itself until all of this stuff ties in and comes around. So uh, sometimes just something simple like a little wall or something like that will end up a full scheme. And it's literally it's broken into, OK, well, next year I'm ready to do this. OK, next year I'm ready to do this. So um, I, I do need a better VIP, basically you know, or, or not that I need two types of systems. I, I do want the website for vetting, but then I still want this other specialty vetting where I'm going and I'm, I'm not just focused on one thing as I am the whole thing. Cause even while I'm at places, I'll find something and be like, Oh, wow, you need to get this taken care of, you know, and, and a lot of times they'll go, well, oh, I never even saw that. I never come back here. I never noticed that. Um, so I do want to do some, some again, like a, a, a VIP type uh, vetting system versus a more um, kind of a broad range. And, and again, I don't want to sound shallow about this at all, but again, coming back to this website where you get to fill out a form and say, this is what my budget is and stuff like that. I think we'll need both of those avenues. Yep. So Danny, what is that ideal project for you and your business? And why is it that ideal project? Is it, you know, um, the, on the larger end of the scale in terms of uh, projects, is it on the, the lower end, you know, one, two day in and out? Uh, what's that ideal project for you, your business? And why is it that? Uh, for me, it's letting me do my thing. Um, so it could be a small 10 by 10 patio or it could be a $160,000 job. Gotcha. Um, just let me do my thing. And I don't, I don't, I don't know how else to say it. I tell people all the time. It might not make sense during the process. It may look like hell during the process, but I guarantee at the end, you're going to be happy because you know, I'll be the one that's happy in the end. And if I'm not happy with it, nobody's going to be happy with it. Um, so my ideal project is, you know, I could say well, it's a $200,000 hardscape job, of course, you know, but for me, it's just let us do our thing, mm -hmm. you know, don't Nick's, micromanage me. <laughs> yeah. Nick, same question to yourself. What's that ideal project for Earthworks and why is it that? I don't, I don't want to sound redundant, but I was going to say the same thing. It's that job that I get to, I get to use my creativity on and that you're going to trust me um, that 
the final product is something that you're going to love because I'm going to get to, I'm going to take the time to get to know the customer and, and um, understand as, as much as I possibly can about their life and their wants and needs. And then let me just be creative and come up with something that I think that you're going to really enjoy. Um, that, that's the ideal um, project. I don't care what size it is, you know, yeah, there's a, there's a certain, you know, benchmark that I want to start at, but you know, it could be a big job, but it could also be just a small backyard patio type of thing. And just, just let me, let me unleash my creativity because that's what I really enjoy. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So I've got two more questions for you guys as we wrap up here. Uh, they're, they're big ones though. And I want to start off with the topic of debt versus no debt in your business. Um, how do you guys operate? What is your personal belief in terms of the debt versus no debt? Um, not just how you've grown the business or your stance right now, but in terms of that as a whole, debt versus no debt in your business, your personal thoughts on that. Um, I'm, I'm on the, the side of no debt. Um, and I, that's just the way that I think I've, I've been raised. Um, never really had a whole lot of debt other than my mortgage. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's probably hard for, for guys that are probably just getting started in the, in the industry, but you know, you, you don't want to, you don't want to string yourself out so far that if there's some sort of a downturn, downturn in the economy and you have all this debt out there that, that it's going to tank your business. You have to, you have to constantly think about, you know, is this a risk that we're willing to take? Will we be able to pay this off in a certain amount of time? And if, if we, you know, if, if we do go three, four months without work, what's that going to look like? Um, because the bills aren't going to stop coming. So, you know, running as debt free as you possibly can, but then also taking advantage of, um, you know, 0% APR and things like that. Um, if you can find, you know, if you can find companies that'll, that'll work with you that way, um, that, that makes a lot of sense if there's something that you really need, um, and, and can't afford to pay, pay it out of the, the, the cash budget for you. So, um, you know, save up and, and buy, buy the best thing that you possibly can at the time, mm -hmm. um, is, is the mantra I think that, that we go with. Definitely. Uh, so I guess this is where we're going to be different because we still have startup debt. Um, we, you know, everything that we've got right now, you know, my wife had created, you know, I created the whole thing. Um, so do we have debt? Most definitely. Um, so in, in, in doing that and taking the step, again, I, I get a lot of advice from uh, Mike. Um, but, you know, he, he kind of reminded me this, this old saying that, you know, if, if you're going to, you know, make money, you need to spend money. Um, there is a huge gamble, like Nick said, especially in startup companies. Um, if anything, we fit into that category of thin ice, I guess you could say. Um, so there's a lot of nervousness in that. Um, and then again, and, and I guess because I refer to Mike so much is because older people in this industry have made so many freaking mistakes that if you don't listen to them and pay attention to them, then you're just completely missing out. Mm -hmm. Um, but Mike told me, you know, and I was really concerned about it because I told him, you know, Hey, we're the people we used to make fun of. We, we wait for these companies to build up by all these trucks and February or something like that, we'd go to the auction and we'd start buying equipment that they, you know, had a couple of hundred hours on it, but it's cheap because they had to get rid of it. Um, and he said, you know, yeah, that's very true. He said, but one thing, you know, I also taught you was quality is recession proof. 
Um, so, you know, could we burn, you know, take a nosedive? Most certainly. I think we're in a good area right now. Uh, Greenville is top 10 in the U.S. to live right now. Um, we've already been set. It, and again, I don't know where these facts come from as much as maybe it's cooler talk. But I've heard anywhere from three to five to seven years worth of recession proof because of the growth that's happening here. Um, so when I get still, though, I don't really look at that as much as when I start to get nervous about this. Um, I always come back to quality will be recession proof because like Mike told me one time before we went through the recession. Um, what, was, what was that? Oh, six, oh, eight. It was yeah. all the way. It was 06 through 08, actually. It was so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Mike said, uh, you know, I said, what will we do? He said, well, we'll hunker down. But because we do such good work, we can go do whatever we want. He said, if I have to, I'll go start blowing Walmart's parking lot if I have to. So um, debt scares the hell out of me. But honestly, I don't know really what else, any other way to do it. Um, it's, uh, we need things. Um, if I try to save up for them, <laughs> it just won't ever happen. I I'll definitely die before I have it. Um, so we're kind of in this taking advantage of 0%, you know, APR, these, you know, extended payments, these rebates, um, and then also, you know, I make sure, you know, every job that I do, again, this is part of efficiency, is I make sure my equipment gets paid just like we do. Um, you know, as a guy, uh, Cody from Southern Charm, and um, he was telling me, he said, everything I own gets uh, a dollar amount put to it on a job. And I said, everything. He said, yeah. He said, I got a chain. And I know what that chain costs. I know what it breaks down to. And I put it to that job if I'm using it on that job. So debt free would be awesome, but it's not realistic on this end. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't know. I wish I was. How many, Nick, how many years are y'all in business? 78 to 2021, 43. God almighty. Yeah. <laughs> God, my man. I can't, well, I guess I was about to say I can't wait, but that's obviously not going to happen. Um, I, I think that's where you want to be. I think Nick's situation is where you want to be. So I guess the real question would be to go to your dad and all them and say, now, can you tell us about debt? Yeah. You know, because I'm yeah. sure they taught you to stay out of debt, but I'm sure they went into a lot of debt. Yeah. You know. Yeah, can you imagine in the in the eighties when the interest rates were so high and everything? I mean, oh yeah, how they came out of that is and it's and amazing. not a lot of manufacturers. You know, there's a lot of competition in manufacturing right now in machines mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Those guys were isolated. You yeah. bought that machine and you paid it, and that's it. Right, and that's probably why instead of uh, owning a skid loader, they shoveled out of the back of a dump truck you know what i mean yeah it yeah just did things the hard way yeah 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 so having said that um no matter how long you've been in business no matter how many years there's going to be some struggles there's going to be growing pains there's going to be just struggles in general so i want to ask the two of you right now in your business as we close down this this interview what is a struggle that you are experiencing in your business um, we talked about it earlier, just, just letting go, uh, of, uh, of the control side of things and letting the guys get more involved in the installation, um, free up my time because sooner or later, I'm not going to have my dad here helping me out with design work and things. And that's going to all fall on me, the design and sales and everything. Granted, I do, I do, you know, at least 50% of it now. But it's all going to be me. So I'm going to have to have somebody that basically replaces me. So my biggest struggle and the thing that that I try to work on constantly is is giving up that um, that control over over the installs. Um, so that's something I, I'm 
I'm working, working on this year and moving forward and also, um, communication, you know, just, uh, communication with the guys, communication with my wife and, and my, my dad, um, within the business and just making sure everybody's on the same page. Um, that's something that, that I struggle with, um, that I always need to work on. So, so those are a couple of my big, big ones. Definitely. Danny? Mine's growth, yeah. growth, 100% growth. I'm trying to figure out how to have my foot on the gas pedal and the brake at the same time. That's, uh, you know, how, how do we keep up? How do we take all the work that I've earned to get at this point? Um, built myself up to a certain point. Um, it's, it's growth, you know, it's, it's employees, it's, it's trucks, it's, you know, anything that's associated with growth right now is, is our struggle. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I can't get it done fast enough. We can't move fast enough. Um, which I guess over, you know, time, maybe a couple of years, I'll kind of settle down a little bit. Um, and we'll kind of hit into a groove, but right now this, pipeline that we're in in our area it's uh you know employees and 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 growth gosh that's that's my biggest struggle yeah i'm i'm coming into one of those years i've been blessed the last two or three with with uh guys that have been coming back part-time guys that have been coming back year year over year um but i'm in in one of those rebuilding years so that's that's going to be a struggle for me this year is, is finding enough guys. Maybe it's the year that I have to buy that mini, mini skid to replace those I'm two guys. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> two people. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, guys. It, it, yeah, go it's ahead. It's a common thing, though, employees. You know, yeah. that's the yeah. biggest one. Definitely. But uh, with all the technology that we have at our disposal, it, uh, it definitely makes it a little bit easier to deal with a labor shortage. Like you said, investing in that mini skids here really makes up for those two guys. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to definitely, uh, definitely rent one for a week or two and, and see, see how that goes. And uh, who knows, maybe this time next year, I'm going to be the proud owner of a mini skid or something. I don't know. <laughs> Well, guys, it's been a pleasure to uh, get to talk to you uh, back when we did a one-on-one -on -one, and now for this roundtable. Uh, it does mean a lot to me that you guys do take the time out. Uh, you could be spending with your family. And if for some reason, you're here with me. Uh, and to be able to share your story and to get this out there, because it does build up this industry. And for that, I do want to say thank you so much for your time. As we close out, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let our audience know any closing remarks, any comments that you want to leave them with and where they can find you online. Nick, let's uh, start with you. Hey, first of all, thanks a lot, Mike. I, I really appreciate you everything that you're doing um, on How to Hardscape and just pushing the, the industry forward. I think it's just great, everything that you're doing. Um, Everybody can find me on Instagram at Earthworks Landscaping RF and uh, on our website at earthworkslandscaping.com. That's that's the best way. If anybody wants to reach out, I'm I'm uh, I'm always up for chatting about anything you want to chat about. So so don't be afraid to reach out. Awesome. And over to you, Danny. Uh, so you know, Danny with Niche Gardens down in South Carolina. Um, the number one spot to find us is on Instagram on our account. Um, again, just like Nick said, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'll answer anything or try to answer anything or try to direct you in, in direction to help you out. Um, and, and mostly, you know, just to put this to the end, everybody throw your hands up at, the, at your landscapers around, you know, wave to them and start stop kind of puff chest and all your local landscapers and stuff like that. This is, this is what this is all about. Um, we're, we're a lot tighter together. And Mike, I, I can't thank you enough, man. I'm flattered by this, man. Um, I never thought anybody would really want to hear my story. So <laughs> I 
I still don't know why you do, but you know, you do. So <laughs> I, uh, I still don't know why people want to sit down and talk uh, hardscaping with me, but for some reason people uh, keep on agreeing to it. So I'll keep doing it for as long as I can. And uh, with that being said, guys, thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you all for listening to today's podcast episode. Visit us at howtohardscape.com for more information. Reach out to us with anything that you want to hear on the podcast. You can contact us on email. We are contact at howtohardscape.com. Subscribe to the podcast. Leave us a rating or review. This really helps us get this podcast out there into more people's ears. Uh, follow these guys because they've already invested uh, the one-on-one time. They've already invested, you know, closing in on two hours with this round table. So go give these guys a follow. Definitely. Uh, they've had to put up with me for, for three hours now. So between the two. Uh, and, and thank you for, for listening to this again. We look forward to meeting with you next week on the How to Hardscape podcast. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. See you, Nick. See you. Awesome, guys. Thanks so much. That's it.